They are walking around with these, these the self-talk saying, well, I'm not smart or I'm not capable or whatever. And it's keeping them from writing the book or starting the business or pursuing the relationship they should. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that was That's a turning huge. point for, for my life. Yeah. Hi, guys, and welcome back to the Living Fully podcast. I'm so excited to bring you this incredible interview today with one of my friends. Um, he is a true expert in the field of functional medicine, um, from starting a functional medicine center in Nashville, Tennessee, to creating one of the top health websites and brands in the entire world and founding the natural supplement line, Ancient Nutrition, which I'm sure you've heard of that. Um, his success in this field has been pretty insane. Um, there's pretty much nothing like this doctor hasn't done. You may have guessed it, Dr. Josh Axe is joining us on the Living Fully podcast today, and I'm so excited because Josh and I have been friends just uh, living in Nashville and having a lot of mutual friends. For a long time, Josh helped me through something that was very personal, um, when I was enduring a lot of pregnancy losses, we'll talk a little bit about that in uh, this. But what might surprise you about today's episode of the podcast is we aren't talking much about health uh, or functional medicine at all. We are talking about the mind. And y'all, he has written this book, uh, Think This, Not That. And to see a doctor approach changes within the body through the aspect of changing the mind is extremely powerful, I think. This book and this interview are very eye-opening because I believe that the mind is just as powerful as so many of the things that we think of using to change our life. So I am um, going to talk about four mindset shifts from his 12 mindset shifts that he has in his book today. And we talk about a lot of things. We talk about visualization. We talk about our grandpas. We talk about so many specific things. Also things, parents, you're going to want to listen to this, like something specific that we can do with our children uh, and how to speak to them. And uh, it's just a killer interview. So if you're in a spot today where you feel stuck or stagnant, whether it's in your career goals or your relationships or your nutrition journey, uh, look no further than this podcast because I believe that some of the things that we cover today will be truly transformational for you like they were to me during this podcast. So without further ado, Dr. Josh Axe. Okay, so I want to start with this. I, I'm, I call you Josh, but you are Dr. Axe. Um, you earned you that Dr. Axe. <laughs> Um, but I have to tell this story because A, it humanizes somebody that is so amazing at what they do and so intelligent and has started all these companies and written all these books. Um, and also it just shows that you are truly so much more than a, a, a doctor. Like you are just, um, the person that you are is, is so much more than that. So, um, early in two. That, oh gosh, this has been five years ago. I was going through uh, a season where I was having pregnancy losses back to back. And um, I had, like a lot of people, gone to doctor after doctor after doctor after doctor. And Sean and I were talking about it. And Sean was like, have you talked to Josh? And I was like, I cannot bother him with this. And she was like, I really think that you need to speak with Josh. And I reached out to you and you were like, can you call me? And I called you. And you started out this conversation with like a very positive mindset of you're going to be able to figure this out. And you started with a prayer too, which I will never forget. And it like mm. made me emotional because I had not in the fifth, five doctor's offices that I'd been to, no one had certainly started out with a prayer that we were going to uh, come to a conclusion that was going to give me what I wanted out of this, you know, thing that I was, I was doing. And um, you proceeded to help me in such a way that was far beyond medicine. You helped me shift my mindset. You, I mean, you gave me all the supplements and you told me, you're like, I think it's the pancreas, this, 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 you know, gave me all the medical stuff, but it was so much more yeah. than that. And I think it's such a beautiful thing when someone who is so educated and knows all of the things about the body and what the body needs and how to heal it takes an approach of mindset and also prayer. That was just really cool. So I just wanted to start with that because, you know, you and I have a history because we have a lot of mutual friends and you and I are friends just live in, in Nashville, um, which you did for a long time. Yeah. But um, I, I was always a really big fan of you and your work, but you helping me through that, like that was just 
much bigger than you probably even realize. So thank you for that. That was just well. Well, well thanks for yeah. Th thanks for letting me. You know, I you know one of the things I get really frustrated with friends about is uh, well, let me say it's kind of I've, I've got two groups, uh, but but one is the the people that um, you know sometimes I'm that are struggling with the health issues and they just don't want to reach out because they just, you know, don't want to bother people. I'm like, yeah. no, I want to help, please mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. reach out. And then there's a couple of people in my life and I'm going to throw my, my mom is one of those people. And it's like, mom, like, you know, you call me three times a day asking me health, <laughs> health questions for your friends. But, um, yeah. 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 So if so, you could find a person in between those two people, that would be the perfect person. That, you know, yes, well, now it's great yes. because you've written these books and you've, you know, you've got all this information out there. So where if you don't have um, Dr. Axe's phone number, you know, you can access this information, you know, a lot of different ways. Yeah. I love the approach that you've taken for so long with uh, what you've done. But I also really love that this is a mindset shift book because I talk so much about mindset. And I think that mindset is so powerful. I talk about a lot of the things too that you talk about with visualization and and things like that. But you went so deep in the book that, you know, I, I, we're going to talk about a lot of things, but I just want to yeah. open with this because there were these things in the book that like, that blew my mind. Like the the nocebo effect, that blew my yeah. mind. Yeah. The yeah. how like if you put a negative thought in a patient's head, that can physically manifest in their body. That's that blew me away. Like the guy with the kidney, something like yeah. that. I just that story blew me away. Can you tell that story actually? Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you here quick. So there are, and this is a real case study. And so there was a man who went into his his oncologist and they diagnosed him with liver cancer and they told him you have three months to live. And um, and the man died about three months and a week later. And then they went in and did the autopsy and they found it was a small benign tumor on the side of his liver and it could have easily been removed and he didn't have liver cancer at all and he should have lived another 30 plus years. And so, you know, there, we've, we've all heard of the placebo effect where you take mm -hmm. a sugar pill or if you believe something and it actually helps your body heal or ch changes your hormones or, or, or gives you a better outcome. And so that's called the placebo effect is this sort of beneficial outcome. But the same holds true for for negative thoughts, if people have in their head that, well, my mom had cancer, so I'm going to get it, or mm -hmm. my dad had a heart attack, so that could likely happen to me. What happens, it becomes this sort of repetitive story in our brains. And there's this really interesting um, uh, ter term for, for, for what happens post that, and it's called neuroplasticity. And neuroplasticity yes. is where your brain starts creating new neural pathways, sending hormonal signals, and even create sending stem cells and growth factors to heal an area, or it starts doing things to shut down. And so, I mean, the power of our beliefs, you know, the book of Proverbs says life, and uh, it says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Well, if you thinketh that you're going to have cancer or that you're going to be dead in three months, you know, that that's likely to, to, to happen. And so our beliefs are way, way more powerful than I think most people believe. And mm -hmm. I can tell you from when I ran my functional medicine clinic, the, um, you know, I could almost tell immediately the results somebody would get on when they came in the office, because there's typically kind of two groups of people. One group was, it was just much more positive. It was, you know what, I've got this, but I can beat it. Like they knew mm -hmm. in their head, yeah. they really believe that I can turn this around. But then there was a whole group of people that, it was, they felt like everything was deprivation. Like, oh, you're telling me I can't do my special case cereal and skim milk anymore, <laughs> you know? And, and I'm like, well, I just told you, you could do like a, a strawberry milkshake essentially for breakfast. I mean, yeah. it's a healthy version, right? But um, I mean, that the mindset is really, really important. And this is something that became even more clear to me. And I touched on this in the last chapter of the book. And I don't know if you know this or not, Mallory, so you might, but um, like, I, I didn't walk for a year about a year ago. So mm -hmm. I went in and had a, and I know so many people were praying for me and I was so grateful for it, but I was in great shape. Like, a, but I hurt my back a few years earlier. Yes. I, I know. Had a, had a, I read yeah, that. And I, and I had a nagging pain in my back and it wasn't going away. And I thought there's a natural procedure called stem cell and PRP. Mm -hmm. I thought I'm going to go and get my back injected and, and with my own cells and it'll help the healing kick on even mm -hmm. more. And so I went in and did this. Well, something went wrong during the procedure. And by the way, there should never be an issue with this procedure, but went in and somehow the next week I felt bad and then worse and worse. Finally, three months later, I woke up and I couldn't walk at all. And we were in Puerto Rico at the time. And we had to have call an ambulance. And you can imagine it's like, 
you know, Chelsea, I've got my, at the time, you know, two-year-old Arwen there and she's yeah. crying like, you know, what's wrong with daddy? I'm getting in the ambulance, go get an MRI. And they say, we think you have an, a, an infection that's gotten into your bone and oh, your spine. Oh my gosh. And so then I, I get on a medical, like I have to have take a medical flight to Florida and meet with an infectious disease doctor there. And he said, you have an infection in your bone and a, and a, and a, and an abscess growing close to your spinal cord. And he said, your prognosis is, you know, the best case scenario, his exact words were, you know, you'll probably have pain the rest of your life. And anytime the weather comes through, you'll be the first to know it. Now, that was what he said to me. And he, <laughs> and he goes, that's bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting bedside manner. But, but, you know, and then he said, the worst case scenario is you're permanently disabled and, and, you know, we'll have trouble walking. And so for me going from just a little bit ago, throwing my two-year-old daughter in the air in the pool, running, deadlifting, squatting, swimming, having no, no issues hardly at all, except for that little bit of nagging pain. And I went and looked online and it was like a one in a million chance that this could happen to somebody. Wow. I mean, it was a crazy odds. And, and then I said, you know what, I, by the way, I, there were emotions I'd never experienced before. Like, and I, I'm a pretty, I'm a very positive person. Yes, you are. I can but attest after, to that. Yeah. Yeah. But after getting that diagnosis, I mean, for the next 24 hours, especially, I felt despair. I felt hopelessness. I just felt, you know, I just felt really, really down. And after a day or two like this, finally, I kind of had a, a spiritual moment where I was like, you know what, this isn't serving me. Like me mm -hmm. thinking about and dwelling on worst case scenarios and not walking again and those sort of things, that that's not serving me. And I thought, you know, um, I need to believe in the healing power of God. I need to um, activate the placebo effect. I need to do the things mm -hmm. to give my body the best outcome because I knew in, in the first question you asked me, if I believed I wouldn't walk again or I would have trouble walking again and live with that pain the rest of my life, there's a much greater chance of that happening if I actually believe that mm -hmm. versus I did everything to start feeding myself and saying, no, you know what? I won't have pain. In fact, I'll be healthier than I was before. I'll get back to lifting weights. I'll get back to throwing my little girl in the air. And so that was my mindset. And with that, uh, I decided to go all in on a natural health protocol and I had to do some conventional therapy. So mm -hmm. I did an antibiotic IV for four weeks. Now, oftentimes people do it for three months. So 12 weeks, they do mm -hmm. antibiotics. I wanted to do the littlest damage possible. Yeah, I wanted yeah. to make sure I killed the infection. So what I did is I got in a hyperbaric chamber for two hours a day. Mm -hmm. I only ate meat and vegetables. I did every vitamin supplement you can imagine. And I was just you know spending a lot of time in prayer. And after four weeks, all of a sudden I was started feeling a little bit better. And, um, and then I got 1% better and 1% better, but the, the disc doesn't have a lot of blood supply. So it takes a long time to heal. So I didn't walk for 10 months and then I was on a wow. walker for two, two months. And, um, and that was just this last, uh, May, May slash June, I started walking again. So it hasn't been that long, but I'm back working out now. I'm able to, now I'm not a hundred percent, but I'm probably back about 75. And I think by the end of the year, I'll be a hundred percent. So, so I'm getting well and I'm already beyond what the doctor said my best case scenario would be. But anyways, I mean, I really had to have, wow. I mean, inactivate this sort of mindset going through this because it was, um, you know, it was, it was, uh, it's so easy to go down rabbit holes. I think a lot of times yeah. people are diagnosed with conditions and you can read all this stuff online and you think, well, you know, uh, you know, this is my likely outcome, but people, it, it is so important that we activate that neuroplasticity of healing if we're going to yes, get our best it is. results. Yeah. I talk about neuroplasticity all the time, like the ability of the brain to change too. I think, I think yep. that so many people, they think I've always been this way. I'm a negative thinker. I always look at the worst case scenario and I'm like, no, you can change that. And you mm -hmm. have to change that. It is a yeah. whole different life when you can look at things. And I'm not saying like, turn your, you know, put your head in the sand and ignore things that are going on. I'm just saying like, take a positive approach and what a, um, you know, God does f funny things to teach us lessons and like of all people to be debilitated, the, the, the health king here. I mean, what, uh, you know, one in a million chances you said for that to happen to somebody like you, but in, in a way, like you're, what a great testament now to other people you can be because it did happen to you. Yeah. It's yeah. And powerful. I think this, yeah. And, and I think, I think that what I, I had a friend who came to visit me and, uh, when I, cause I spent this time in Florida in an Airbnb and, and he said, um, 
hey, what have you been doing since you've been laid in bed like this? And I said, well, I'm writing this book. So I wrote, I wrote this book here, Think This, Not That, when I was in bed mm -hmm. the whole time. And I said, I've been running my businesses. I said, I, you know, Arwen has been crawling in bed with me. We've been watching Peppa Pig and Paw Patrol. You know, we've been, <laughs> I mean, I've been trying to maximize my days. And, um, and he said, gosh, if that were me, I'd be, you know, drinking Mountain Dew and eating Cheetos. And I said, well, you know, I, first off, I get that because I had some days I really felt like that. Yeah. But I said, you know what? I just, I have a lot of purpose. Yeah. You know, I have so much purpose. I don't know. Let's say, let's say the worst case scenario happened. You know what? I'm not going to give up on life. Like I'm still going to do everything I can to live the best life possible. And so it's this thing that, you know, God can turn all things, you know, uses all things for good yeah. and pain can be turned into purpose. And I experienced this with, with, with my mom already. I think that was something that was really powerful for me to see is that my mom, when she had cancer, um, she really fought it nobly mm -hmm. and she didn't let herself be a victim. And then also after she beat it naturally, when I helped her the second time she beat cancer naturally, she started helping other women who were going through breast cancer make, she, she would have them over with her Vitamix and teach them how to make green <laughs> smoothies and juice their vegetables and do it. You know, so she used her pain for purpose. And I also thought about this too. You know, one of the things I was so conscious about when I was in bed. By the way, the only thing I could do was crawl. I couldn't even be in a wheelchair because the pain was mm. so bad. So I just would would, wow. would crawl places when I was able to do that. But um, I was very conscious of, I've got my daughter now, who, two turning three, uh, who's who's watching me. Mm -hmm. And so I can go through this complaining and being mean to other, all kinds of things and have maybe a good excuse for it. But I wanted her to see this is how you deal with difficult situations and trials in life. You know, mm -hmm. we deal with it with prayer. We deal with it with a plan. We have community around us. We allow ourselves to be supported. And so I really did my best to, you know, um, be a role model for her. Of, yeah. Hey, this is how we deal with hard things in life. And, and, um, but yeah, I totally believe and see, you know, God, you know, God, God uses it for good. And, and I, I mean, I've grown through it. One, one other thing that I, I heard a, a friend of mine who's a pastor and he shared this with me and I thought this was so powerful. And his, and, and his, he, he lost his wife when I had this situation going on. And, um, and he went and preached the next Sunday hmm. and he said, and he, and he cried a lot during the sermon, but he just said, you know, the reason I feel like I need to get up here is, is that, um, you know, I, is I'm trying to be selfless and give a message I think is going to, you know, impact your life in a positive way. And, um, and so one of the, one of my prayers as I was going through this was, um, God, let me be refined through this. I want to grow through this. I want to press and I want to let this refine me. And so with that, you know, I definitely am much, much more, you know, compassionate, empathetic towards people and the yeah. pain of others as I've gone through this. And so I think that was a good lesson of like, like, don't like a lot of times we view pain or stress as a negative thing, but if we can pursue, see that sometimes as a way to grow and get better, it's a, you know, oftentimes that, that, that'll be the outcome. Yeah, absolutely. I believe that wholeheartedly. <clears throat> and, you know, you were talking about purpose and you're talking about your daughter, you know, watching you. And when I um, started reading your book and also like I had just experienced a loss, uh, we lost my grandpa in December. Oh, yeah, I saw that. I'm sorry. Yes, mm. thank you. And he, just like your grandpa, was truly this just incredible character and just so central in my story. And Josh, when you were writing about him and writing about how when you were at his funeral and you were realizing all these things that like, you know, when people stand up there and talk about you at your funeral, they're not talking about like, here are the businesses he started. Here are the yeah. titles he held. Here is, I mean, how many letters? It's alphabet soup after your name. I don't even I don't even know like what some of these things mean after your name, but they're not talking about that. They're talking about like, the person that he was and how he helped me and his character. And I really loved how you, that was a thread through the book because it was just, it meant a lot to me. And mm. I just really, um, I thought that was really special. So, and then I want to get into the mindset shifts, but this is just like, this is the ultimate mindset shift to like in your time on earth. Like, do you live a life this way or do you live a life this way? I mean, living a life that is built off of like, how do you say it? Like instead of your to do list, it's like to be list. To I be loved list. that. Like yeah. to be, I want to be more compassionate. I want to be a better mom. I want to be, I, that I immediately implemented that. So can you just tell us a little bit about that? Because I did not know yeah. that part of your story. Yeah. Just a little bit about yeah. like your grandpa and, yeah. um, yeah. Just so, especially because it's timely for me right now. So I loved that part. Yeah. So the second chapter of the book, I get into this and I, I, I call it, uh, 
you know, go from an accomplishing mindset to a becoming mindset. Yes. And um, so I'm at my grandfather's funeral and um, and we're standing there and we're at the moment in the service where uh, the, the the pastor says, leading the service, he says, does anyone have any last final words about Howard? So my grandfather's name was Howard. And um, and I have a man next to me, one of my uncles, and um, and he just cries out like he's in his 70s, he just cries out. Howard was my best friend. And what's funny is I looked over at him and I thought, well, I don't think you're my grandfather's best friend. I think it's like he's got <laughs> all these other that. people I know yeah. he's closer to. And so at first it like gives a little bit of me giving a little judgment. And then but a split second later, I was like, you know what? He was he he was your best. He probably was your best friend. Because half the people, hundreds of people there, half the people were, were probably thought my grandfather was their best friend because he was just that person. And so if you can imagine, he was uh, 96 years old when he died. He worked his entire life up until he was 96 years old. And um, he had this old weathered hand, again, World War II Navy vet, and he put his arm on your shoulder <laughs> and he would look you in the eyes and pray for you. And and he, so a cool story. So when he was 44 years old. He worked, lived in Ohio. He worked on telephone lines. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, and then he decided, I don't want to do this anymore. Like he said, I want to like do something I love with my life, something yeah. I'm passionate about. So him and my grandmother saw this ad in the newspaper that said, um, there's a lake for sale, a pond yep. and a campground. And so they took every dollar they had, put all their money into buying this um, this pond and campground. They turned it into a big swim park. It's called Winona Lake. It's up by mm -hmm. Lima, Ohio. And, um, and they ran this for, he ran it for 52 years so and I had the awesome. best childhood memories ever. Absolutely amazing. And, um, and, but one of the things going back to this, like, like my, my the other people at the wet, wet or at the funeral were saying things like Howard saved our marriage and, uh, you know, and, and he would go to the hospital with people. He volunteered at church and he would go and like pray for people at, at you know, in the hospital, bring them their favorite meal, sit and talk with them. And, um, and I remember going and doing that to, with, with him when I was a kid. And so all that being said, like, I remember there was this time at the, at his funeral. And at the time, I think I just wrote, wrote my, you know, one of my, my first book and was having a level of, you know, success in certain mm -hmm. eras. And I thought that's not success. What success is, is this, it's, it's having people that love you and adore you and that you've really impacted their life personally in a positive way. And so I, I just had this, I, this thought of like, you know, success is not fame. It's not money. It's not all those things. It's who you become, mm -hmm. because that's what people talk about is who, who you yeah. become. And I, th I think that's also a very, you know, Christian centered message yes. when you look at sort of like becoming like Christ, it doesn't say accomplish this or do this. Now yeah. I think accomplishments start being birthed out of the better accomplishment starts being birthed out of who you become, because if you become the right type of person, you're going to be a better mom, a better mm -hmm, dad. You're mm -hmm. going to be a better grandparent. You're going to mm -hmm. be a better son or daughter. You're going to be a better business leader and in sewing into yeah. your team. And, you know, and that's the thing. And I, I, you know, being in Nashville, there's so many amazing people there. Again, you know, we talked about Sean and Andrew. Mm -hmm. I see this with you guys too. It's like, you know, you guys are building businesses like the East fam, their business is really built on, Hey, let's add value to families. Yes. You know, I think about you, like when you're creating you know, your pajamas, which I told you, like everyone, every woman in my house your is wearing family your pajamas is the now. Best. When, when I got here to Puerto Rico to our house, the first package I opened, I was like, <laughs> Sundays. And I was like, oh, this is for my mother-in-law. So my mother-in-law yeah. had ordered your pajamas. That is and so, so awesome. Everybody in my house is wearing the Sunday's pajamas oh, I just love y'all. <laughs> but, but again, knowing your heart, it's very much like you guys are using, you know, you know, you're, 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 you're committed to excellence. Like we're going to yeah. create the best pajamas, the best thing possible. We're going to do it and, and be a purpose-driven organization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it's not that we shouldn't try and accomplish things though. Again, we should try and accomplish things. They should always be secondary to though, who we become along yes. the way. Amen. And I love it too, that you stamped it because I, I can remember this, the becoming mindset, the becoming mindset, like think about all of these things and like, who do you want to become? Like, let that be your mindset and kind of like shift, which is hard for an achiever. Like you and I, I'm sure we're the same oh, yeah. on all those personality yes. tests, you know, mm -hmm. it's in our, it's in our blood to, to be achieving and to be doing and, and to be wanting for more. But it's so amazing, like when it can be attached to something that's for the greater good and helps people because that helps with, you know, the person that you are trying to become while also like building these big businesses. So I loved that. I loved the becoming mindset. And speaking of mindset, so this book, Think This, Not That, it's a uh, it's birthed from the eat this, not that. You know, that's the first version of Dr. Axe yeah, that I got right. was the eat this, not yes. that. 
you were telling me to put pumpkin in everything in the middle of summer. And you know what? I listened to you because I knew you know. And hey, and it healed whatever it was supposed to heal because everything worked out. But yes. um, I do think that these mindset shifts are really huge in the book. So I pulled out like the ones that we'll touch on that yeah. I were my favorite. And I and I think we've already talked about the mindset shift number one, which was creating a break a breakthrough by unlimiting your beliefs. So you already talked about that one. That one's really big about your own personal journey, I feel yep. like. And <clears throat> just that like yeah. shifting that mindset, that positive mindset. I feel like- Yeah, I, I, yeah, I do want to say something about the limiting beliefs thing, because yeah. I, I think that there are a lot of people have this, sometimes it's just one thing. You have one single belief that is wrong about something. Oh, it could yes. be a Like wrong the teacher about, story too, that you yeah. wrote about in the book. Yeah. That was a let, big let me one. tell the, I'll, I'll give a, I'll do the one minute version of that real quick okay. just so people can get I liked this. that story. But, That's why I was remembering but, it. But when I was in high school, first off, I was just, I barely graduated high school. I graduated with a C minus GPA, but I barely graduated. So I went in freshman year of high school and a teacher asked me to stay after class. Her name was Miss Noble. And, and she said, Josh, what do you want to do after high school? She didn't even say after you graduated because she probably didn't think that would happen. But she said, what do you want to do after <laughs> high school? And I said, I want to be a doctor. And the reason I said it was laughed, the year before, right? yeah, she laughed out loud. Ugh. And and I was like, my mom just went through cancer the year before. And I was like, I want to help people get healthy. Like that was on my mm -hmm. mind. And she said, listen, you got an F on this paper. You got a D minus in the class right now. You'll be lucky to graduate high school. And mm -hmm. I left. And that was it. And I walked out of there thinking my takeaway as a 14-year-old boy was, well, I'm not smart because I just mm -hmm. had this authority tell me. And then mm -hmm. two weeks later, my mom brings me to a doctor and they diagnose me with ADHD mm -hmm. and prescribe medication. And I think, and, and then I think to myself, well, not only am I not smart, I'm like medically not smart. There's something yeah. really wrong with me. So I just stopped trying in high school. Finally, barely graduate high school. The only reason I graduated is because I didn't want to make my dad too furious. <laughs> and I know he'd just be furious <laughs> if I was the you know, only fa the family member to not yeah. graduate. And so I end up, um, applying to a lot of schools mm -hmm. and I get denied by a lot. Mm -hmm. The one school I still want to really go to is university of Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And I get a letter from them saying you're not accepted, but if you come and take summer class, take these four summers, like these summer school classes and you average, average above a 3.0, we'll let you in. It was the first year they ever started doing that. And so I was like, well, I'm going to do this. Cause like, I want to try, like, I don't want to be the kid staying at home <laughs> in a community college. Like I want to go. And so I went and tried. The first class I had to take was English 101. Mm -hmm. And so I went and I took it and I, and I, and I, my first assignment was a writing assignment and I just really tried. And then I had the teacher and it was Miss Williams. And a few days later, she said, Josh, can you stay after class? And I thought, oh no, this is like deja vu. <laughs> and she said, what's your major? And I said, I haven't picked one because which freshman college, you know, not anyways, I didn't pick a major yet. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, um, I want to let you know that, um, I think you should consider being an English major or journalism major because you're a really talented writer. I said, okay. She said, you got an A on this paper, the highest grade in the class. I think you're a really talented writer and, um, and you should do something with it. And I said, okay. And I walked out, but I had what, like in the book, I, like, I call it like a mind a shift memory or, transplant? Or a, mem a memory transplant. I remember that. That's such a good, yeah. yeah. Because like, I, and it's like a diseased organ. I had this belief that was literally creating disease, ruining part of my life and my, mm -hmm. my whole, my, my, my mind. And when I had one person tell me I was capable, I was good, I was smart, it was like, boom. And I grabbed a hold of that. And then it was like, I got a 3.0, above a 3.0 in college. I went to Johns Hopkins, got a 3.9. Unbelievable. When I graduated yeah. there. But now, the only reason I say those things is that it was just a mindset. And so they are walking around with these, these the self-talk saying, well, I'm not smart or I'm not capable or whatever. And it's keeping them from writing the book or starting the business or pursuing the relationship they should. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's just that one limiting belief. And so I go through in the book how to yep. exactly how to replace that. But I did want to mention that because that was just, you know, that's, that was that's a turning huge. point for, for my life. Yeah. Yeah. And to yeah, and to think that it can be something so simple, for, to think that it can be something so simple that holds you back. Because it is sometimes like one limiting belief, one single thing that's keeping people from yeah. so much potential. And to think that it could be like one simple thing that can completely shift and correct that, it's just, it's really powerful. All of these mindset shifts are really powerful, but, but I did really like that one. Um, okay. And then the second one, it's actually mindset. We, that was the first one in the book. And then the second one was what we've already talked about with your kind of with your grandpa, the redefining success by yeah. becoming, not accomplishing. And there was a quote, because I really like this quote. 
from the book that I wanted to read. You said, I began to think about people, the people I admired the most. Why did I hold them to such high esteem? I noticed a common thread. Their goal wasn't only to reach a certain milestone in their career or cross off a lift of lofty ambitions. They aspired to be better men and women than they were the day before and to positively influence other people. And I was like, it just seems so simple, but like, why do we not live that way? You know, Mm, I mean, it's that's that was such a good quote. I really love well, that. And, and to answer that question, I think part of it is society. Like society, what do what do what does society praise? It's accomplishments, it's talent, mm-hmm. it's those things versus versus not this. But it's uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And talk about um, our possible selves. I also really liked what you wrote about mm. about our possible selves in the book because um, I think that. A, a lot of us don't even like know what our poss- what our possible selves yeah. could even look like. Like nobody even has yeah. a clear vision of that. Um, so talk a little bit about that before we move on to this next mindset. I also liked that. Yeah, and there's some amazing. Uh, I, I've spent so many the past many years studying psychology, and so there's a lot of this sort of. And I really make it simple in the book, but this is really powerful psychology on the future selves. And so one of the things they go through is if well, we go through several studies, and basically mm-hmm. what happens is people, they don't realize that we have our identity, who we are is tied to who we are now, who we were in the past, Mm -hmm. and who will be in the future. Most people think themselves in the future that they will be the same person in the future than they are today or they were in the past. Hmm. And so it's a pretty, so that's a pretty interesting concept. But Mm -hmm. the people that are the most successful in life, the people that have the best marriages, the people that have the best health, the people that have the most successful businesses, they see their future selves as being better and improved and and, yeah. and and more in an ideal scenario. Now, one of the things I talk about in the book is it's very hard to picture ourselves like that. Mm-hmm. So one of the things we can oftentimes do is picture ourselves in the shoes of somebody else mm-hmm. who's done what yeah. we want to do. And this is very biblical because, you know, when you look at the Bible, it's like, well, the ultimate aim is being like Christ. And so that would be an example from that religious standpoint. Well, what should yeah. I aim for? Who should I be like? Mm-hmm. You know, well, your future self should be trying to be that. Yes. And so the, the more we can say, yeah, did, you, did you ever, I'm curious, because I know you, you grew up Catholic. Yep. I grew up, I grew up Protestant. But when I was in youth group, when I was a kid, we had these little bracelets and they said WWJD. Oh, I wore the bracelet. What, what, yeah, the yeah, Catholic yeah. kids wore the bracelets yeah, too. Yeah, I, thought yeah. We, I thought it was cross-denominational. So, <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. you know, WWJD. But mm-hmm. it really, it's such a powerful concept because I yeah. would say that's the thing. Now, we could kind of take a step back or or down from that and say, okay, well, if you want to be good at investing in in, in your money, what mm-hmm. would Warren Buffett do? Yes. Right? Mm-hmm. If you want to start a pajama company, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> what would Mallory do? Right? Yes. It's the sort of, it's like, that. that's the, but that's the one of, one of the things I do is I think about like, okay, if I want to be a great dad, who are some of the best dads I know? Mm-hmm. And some I've spent some good time with, like Michael Hyatt. I don't know if you know mm-hmm. Michael Hyatt, but, but mm-hmm. Michael, he's got five daughters, rock star dad. He told me this. The five so, daughters guy, Right. Well, that's a different one. So Michael Hyde, now that's Oh, you've got a lot of friends. Okay, you've got a lot of with friends five with five da- daughters. Oh, dude, I have so many <laughs> friends with daughters. That might be your future. Like, and that's why I, I probably have two. I'm a girl dad right now, two daughters yeah. too. So, but Michael, t- listen, both Michael and Isaac told me this. Michael is in his 60s and he still brings his 40, they all still live in the Nashville area. He still brings his 40-year-old daughters on date nights. Mm. Still. That's awesome. And Isaac does the same thing. Once a month, he brings his daughters all on a date night. Mm-hmm. And so for me, but my, my my point there is, is like, okay, if I want to be a great dad, what would Michael do? Yeah. What would Isaac do? And so I think that makes it easier rather than you just yes, think about does. your future self, tie it to who are those mentors, those people in life, mm-hmm. or my grandfather or your grandfather, yep. thinking about mm-hmm. who were they, what makes them great? Okay, how can I, and here's that idea now, is you take who they are, who you could be in the future and who they are now, and you do exactly what they do right now. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You model. Yeah. You, 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 well, it you also model. helps to make decisions for the future self, not just thinking about yourself right now. You you had a funny quote about Homer Simpson or something in yeah. the in yeah. the book. I remember. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know. Yeah. So, so 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 here it is. So by the way, there's a great psychologist who gave this analogy. So I don't want to take the full credit for this example. By the way, I was not allowed to watch Simpsons growing up. Yeah, so, I don't think I was um, either. Because, but I liked the but, example. It was it stuck but, with me. <laughs> but 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 Marge says this to Homer. She says. Uh, um, he, uh, she said, Hey, don't you want to go and spend time with the kids? And he said, 
And she said, you know, because don't you want to be like close to them when they're older? And he mm -hmm. goes, that, that's a problem for future Homer. And then he, yeah. he basically then drinks a whole bottle of vodka. <laughs> but this is a great analogy. If you drink a whole bottle, if you just, if you drink way too much, you're not thinking about, like, if I would drink way too much, I'm not thinking about future Josh. No. I'm thinking about mm -hmm. Josh right now. Mm -hmm. And that immediate, that's not mm -hmm. successful thinking. So. Yeah. But yeah. thinking in that like possible self, thinking of the possible self, I really love that too, because <clears throat> a lot of times, you know, when I talk about like visualization and things like that, people are like, I need help getting there. I don't know yeah. what I want in my future. I don't even know like who I am right now because there's so much busyness, as you also talked in, in the book about, like there's mm -hmm. so much going on all the time that you can't even really think of like, where am I at right now? Like, who do I want to be? So I love that shortcut with the possible self, like seeing somebody that you admire or that is already living their life that way and emulate that. I think that's really powerful yeah. and a really powerful tip. Um, okay, the next mindset shift I love because as a person who has, um, I accomplished a lot and succeeded and succeeded and succeeded until I stopped. And then it was like failure after failure after failure. Mm -hmm. And as a person who was really afraid and of failing and very fearful of anything but winning, I certainly learned my biggest lessons from my failures. And so I really liked that chapter. And I really liked how you talked about this initial, you'd had all, you'd had a lot of success. And then you had this idea that ended up being a failure. Um, not, mm -hmm. you know, a really a failure, but how it led you to ancient nutrition at the end. No, you know? it, it was a, it was a pretty big failure. It was a pretty big failure. So <laughs> yeah, know. you're, you're being can... kind. It was, yeah. Um, Okay, so can you tell us a little bit about that? Because yeah. especially when people see someone that who's who has succeeded in the ways that you've succeeded, it's hard for people to picture the failures, especially like a big failure. Yeah. But also, I love what happened at the end of that failure is that it guided you to something else. It happened to me every single time I um, failed or something didn't work out how I thought it would be. It was supposed to. It would a hundred percent lead me to something better. So I really love that that's one of the mindset shifts. So the mindset shift is flip the fear to turn on the growth, which I really love. Um, yeah. Okay, so talk a little bit about that. And then I want to read a quote because I really like that chapter. Yeah. So um, just to tell the story. So I, I uh, Jordan Rubin and I own, own Ancient Nutrition now, you know, and it's mm -hmm. been incredibly successful as a company. But before that, Jordan and I started a company. And I had, I had, my associate took over my practice. I went from functional medicine practice to do this. And, um, and Jordan had sold Garden of Life and then mm -hmm. went in all, in all in on this. And it was a company where we were shipping grass-fed beef and kefir and kale mm -hmm. chips and kombucha all over the country. And, um, and it failed miserably. And the reason <laughs> was is shipping. Like we didn't account for like yeah. in July, grass-fed beef. Like it just wasn't the time for it. Now, now it would probably work the idea. Mm -hmm. But back when we did it 12, 10, 12 years ago, it just wasn't, it wasn't the time. And so like, I lost hundreds of thousands. I lost everything I had. Mm -hmm. Jordan lost everything he had. And I remember Chelsea and I were in 30A when I got a call of Jordan saying like, we're, we're out, like this is over essentially. And I was like, I had to go and tell Chelsea. And we had like a month, a month yeah, left of, of, expenses. of finances yeah. in the bank. Mm -hmm. And this was only like nine years ago. So this wasn't like forever ago. And we just got down and we prayed and we said, you know what, um, God, you got this. And I'm like, there, there's this quote I've seen in the, uh, you know, in one of those shops, you know, actually a shop in Nashville and it says, you know, get on your knees and pray, then get on your mm -hmm. feet and work. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and it was that sort of mentality. And so I was like, I'm just going to go all in on DrX.com, then my website. Mm -hmm. And we did. And then it just, at one point, the, a few months later, just exploded, started taking off and, um, yeah, it, it was just just crazy. But you know, I th this chapter is a lot about um, growing. You know, this was really interesting. I didn't think that this would be the case until I did the research. If people have one of their main goals is being happy, saying like, "I want to be like," I'm trying to be happy myself. I'm going to pursue happiness. They end up less happy. Mm. Isn't that crazy? Mm -hmm. That if somebody yeah. is saying to themselves, yeah. "My main goal is I'm going to try and make," and there's a lot of people doing this today, like I'm going to try and be happy. That's my goal. They end up not happy versus what the, what the, what the studies show the people that are the most happy are the people that are growing in life. Mm. They're growing in character. They're growing, but, and, and it's not means their business growing. It's just that they're yeah. pursuing growing and getting better. And so 
we we kind of talk about these two mindsets in the book. One is a fear-based mindset. Yep. That that and what people typically do is is part of that mindset is I want to look good in the public eye. So mm -hmm. for instance, like oh yeah, I want I, I, know I want that everyone <laughs> I want everyone to think on the outside that our marriage is perfect, and and so like I don't want to go to counseling or I don't want to mm -hmm. share this or whatever because if it gets out somewhere, then that's going to make this perfect exterior, people are going to realize it's yeah. not perfect on the inside. And that's really that mindset. They do studies with kids. And if parents, this is really important for parents, and I'm really aware of this now, is that you don't want to tell your kids they're perfect. And mm -hmm. you don't want to just tell your kids and only congratulate them when they do when they win. Like you want to congratulate them for, 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 for effort. Mm -hmm. And for giving it their all and for operating with character. It's like if they're in a soccer game and, you know, your daughter, you know, knocks down somebody and then helps them back up. It's like after yeah. the game, you really need to tell them, I'm so proud of you. I know you lost the game, but I'm mm -hmm. so proud that you, you know, you gave it your all and you showed good sports. Yeah. It's, it's, but in the book they go through, if that happens as a kid who that adult becomes is amazing. If not, Wow. It's, mm -hmm. it's, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's really, really surprising. And so the people that grow the most are the people saying, I want the challenge. You know yeah. what? It's okay. If I failed, I understand I'm going to fail and mm -hmm. I'm just going to keep going through the failing because my goal is not to not fail. My yes. goal is to grow. Yeah. And so that was an important concept that that's I, a, that I yeah, shared. Yeah, that's there. a great one. And you um, had, I think there are three things, um, like the three steps on how we change our relationship with failure. Because I think that, you know, now it's probably a lot easier for you because you've had the failure and you've seen, oh, yeah. wow, look, I built this successful company after it. So you have proof in your mind. But this one part of it that I really liked. Um, so I, I call, I wrote a whole, actually the chap, the last chapter in my book, uh, my first book, Living Fully was called, yeah. is about curveballs. And like life just throws us mm. these curveballs and you don't expect yeah. these curveballs to happen. And there was one piece of this like three part, um, how to change your relationship with failure that was like, keep your eye on the prize, keep looking at the bigger picture. Like it was very similar to something that I always said about the curveballs. It's like, Sometimes mm. when you get thrown this curveball, like you just forget where you're standing. Like you yeah. just, you forget who you are. You forget what you want. You forget the bigger picture. You just so badly want to be out of this thing or out of the pain that you don't make the decision based on that future thinking. And so I really liked how that was your, the first piece kind of of this step for you too, because I think it's so important. And so many people just get so thrown off their rocker that they just forget who they even are and they make the mm -hmm. wrong decision and then they've taken yeah. 10 steps back. So, you know. It's, uh, yeah. that was something so, that I felt like was, you know, very on brand yeah. or it was the same thing that I say. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, and he, here's how I think about this. A lot of it is based on the lens of, in, in which you look at situations yeah. through, because, you know, when, when I, and, and I try and use pain and pleasure to move myself forward and move patients and the people mm -hmm. I'm working with forward, because here, here's an example. Like my brother-in-law, who I respect a lot, and I'm really proud of him for this, he, um, he's he got a great job and makes a lot of money, does really mm -hmm. well. But he wants to be able to earn more and do something he loves. Mm -hmm. But he would have to go back to school to do it for like three, you know, well, two and a half years, okay? So mm -hmm. uh, he wants to become a nurse practitioner and 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 be in the health field and do some things. And But it's like, well, for th two, three years, he's going to lose money and it's going to be really hard and they're going to have to, he's going to have to sell his boat with mm -hmm. a joke in the family because he <laughs> loves boating and he's going to have to cancel his golf <laughs> membership and all kinds uh. of stuff. But, you know, he's really thinking about that long. So, so that's painful. It's like, gosh, mm -hmm. the next three years, those are going to be painful but now but then he's thinking about you know what we're going to have to start having kids soon mm -hmm. and i really want to be able to have more freedom to take the family vacations and more money like and do these things and do the thing i love and so yeah. I, I think that it's the people that are most successful and the people that overcome fear is they're always looking on the other side of fear they're mm -hmm. always looking on what's the prize what's the yeah. reward when i get past that and so if you can fix your eyes on that thing that you really want and build up a lot of pleasure with knowing what a blessing and great thing that will be. Mm, it I really helps that. you get through the fear. But I think it's all about perception. Like you could have, you know, think about it like this, like, you know, as metaphorically, like if you've got a giant standing, a dragon standing in your way or a giant, 
and you're kind of looking up at it, you're like, wow, if your eyes are fixed there, but biblically speaking, if your eyes are fixed on, you know, a big God who's behind you, who's about a mm-hmm. hundred times the size mm-hmm. of him, you're not as worried anymore. So yeah. I think a lot of it, so in the book, that chapter, I really go through, here is how to shift that focus. Yes. Uh-huh. And um, yeah. Yeah. And you also talk about taking smart risks because you said that you learned a lot about like data, you know, and things look, that you need to pay attention to. Look, 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 like pajamas, you yes. know? Yes. Yes, exactly. Well, and two, it's like, you know, shipping. I mean, we were just now literally just talking about shipping. These these things that you don't think about initially, like that just come to your attention, like, oh, shoot, this could sink yes. the ship. Like, you know, yes. pay attention to this. Yes. Um, so I think that that's really smart, taking smart risks. And then I really also like the Batman effect, the taking a third person, which we've already talked about, kind of view of well, it. Well, um, let me talk about it because it's one of my, it, it's a, I think it's such a gem. So they did this study on self-awareness. Mm-hmm. And by the way, I think self-awareness is important in everything because. Amen. Yeah. Well, like when I, when I think about Amen. like, like I love studying spirit, like people that are really spiritually strong, whether it's a mother Teresa or Martin Luther King Jr. Or St. Francis of Assisi or St. Augustine or whoever it is. I love and, and there's something about if you've ever been around a priest or a pastor or a rabbi or a oh, Buddhist yeah. monk, that there's a serenity to them. Mm-hmm. Like, like the, with that thing that they have, you're wondering, what is that thing that they have? Mm-hmm. It's an awareness of themselves. It's a, an awareness of the spiritual. It's awareness of others. Like they're aware. Mm-hmm. That's that thing that's a 10 out of that's so high for them. So if yeah. you're wondering what what is that thing that they remain this calmness and this peace and this wisdom, that's what it is. So in this chapter, they go through, well, how do we make kids more aware? And the, they they had them do an exercise where they went in and they said, okay, we're going to have you go and build this, build this thing. Okay. Do these puzzles, build this thing, work on this thing. And there's three categories. One, they just had set, told the kids, hey, just go in there and, and work on this. Mm-hmm. The second group, they said, hey, Johnny, we want you while you're in there to think about yourself like they call it self distancing distancing and how what good of a job you're doing on doing this so they had them <laughs> think about themselves doing it they became self aware but the third group and this is amazing they said go in and do that exercise but do it as your favorite as, as your as your as your favorite uh hero and so for like some of the girls it was like a Disney princess, like Elsa or Moana. Mm-hmm. For the boys, it was like Batman. So therefore the study is called the Batman <laughs> yeah. study. Yeah. And so these kids, the kids that were self-aware were 13% better at doing the activity. The kids who had the identity shift were 23% more effective at doing it. And it shows like, I mean, this is this future self in a way too. This all connects back to our identity of who we believe That's, we are. Yeah. Because if you believe you are capable of doing great things. If you believe you're Batman or a princess mm-hmm. or Warren Buffett or capable of loving someone like Mother Teresa, whatever it is, then you're much, much more successful. But it's a it's a pretty That's wild. That was that was one of my favorite studies in the book. Yeah. That's that was, a great that a study. Yeah. I love that. The Batman effect. That was really cool. Yeah. And it's powerful. Like even in kids, it's powerful in you know, middle-aged adults, it's probably powerful in older people. Like this whole yeah. like visualizing yourself as capable and yeah. as healthy or, you know, whatever it is that you're trying yes. to get to. It's just, it's it's like all throughout the book. It's just over and over and over. Like the, these tools were just incredible. And I, you know, I want to finish with my favorite mindset shift. And there are 12, there's 12 in the book, right? 12. I think this mm-hmm. is number 11. Um, visualize to realize because um, I think that visualization is so powerful and I love um, so many of the things that you talk about in the visualization chapter are the same exact things that I talk about. And um, I loved your uh, house in 30A story, how you and Chelsea yeah. were on your bikes on your honeymoon, and you looked over and you yeah. said, I'd love to have a house here. And I've heard this over and over and over again. I talk all the time about vision boards. So like, I want you to talk a little bit about this because I knew how the story was going to end when I started reading that in the chapter. I was like, he's going to put this on his vision board and it's going to, he's going to look back at it and he's going to have yeah. bought the house on his vision board accidentally or like the lot beside it yeah. or something like that. Yeah. So, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll give, I'll give the quicker version here, but yeah, Chelsea and I are on our, we took a mini honeymoon in 38. We got da- married down there in seaside mm-hmm. area in Florida, Panhandle, Florida, and we're, we're cruising around on those little cruiser bikes and, and we, 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 we see these houses and I'm like, I mean, this is literally our first day as a married couple. 
Yep. And um, and we're in the, we're in those one of those little white cottages like on mm -hmm. the beach, you know, mm -hmm. in Seaside. I That's know. Where we're sitting. <laughs> And so, and so we, you know, we went back and I'm like, let's do a vision board. And so we started doing it and we're like, it'd be so cool to have a house here. Okay. It's going on the vision board. And then I'm like, well, let's create a plan. How much do we need to save for the next how many years? And, and so we put together a plan to do that. Well, um, about five years, six years later, we're down there with my in-laws and we're on those cruiser bikes. And there's a couple lots for sale. We're realizing down there, there's almost no lots left. Mm -hmm. I mean, down there. And so I said to them, I said, man, it'd be amazing to get a lot, but we don't have the money right now to get it ourselves. But then I, I, I had this idea. I'm like, you know, would you guys want to go in a house together? Mm -hmm. And they said, well, possibly yes. And then before we knew it, I don't know how it happened. We bought the lot. Okay. Yeah. And then a couple of weeks later, I'm in my office. I'm actually doing a podcast and I'm looking up at my vision board. And I thought, what is so familiar about this picture? Because I went online and just did a Google search for watercolor home mm -hmm. and watercolor. And I put it up there. Well, what's crazy is there's thousands of houses down in this neighborhood. And the picture I put on my vision board six years earlier, part of it was a lot. And it was the lot that we bought. Isn't and that it's so random and crazy. <gasps> and um, and yeah, and so I go through the process in the book of it's called visualization and realization. Mm -hmm. But actually, there's one step before visualization, and that's prioritization. You need yes. to prioritize Talk about because it all the time. Yeah, I have people saying, well, I want to do this in life. I want to have this house or this car, or this thing. And then you get there and you're like, well, that wasn't really that satisfying. That didn't mm -hmm. lead to the sort of life I really yep. wanted. And so I go through the five areas in the book that you really want to prioritize down to live the best life possible. And then from there, once you prioritize, then you visualize. Yes. And I invite God into the process, Holy Spirit, and say, hey, so what should I. this look like? Mm -hmm. And then from there, it's, okay, well, What's the strategy? Yep. You know, how are you going to save the money? How are you going to build the business? I give an example of like, how do you create a great family life? Well, here are the 10 strat, the 10 steps or the 10 things you do. And then it's, then you create systems. So yes. those things just regularly happen. And then you realize the result, but it's a really, I think, powerful process. And, and if you get the book, you'll be able to go through that in there. Yep. I'm saying, here's exactly how, how you do that. Yes. Yeah, so prioritize, visualize, strategize, systemize, realize. Yeah. Um, yeah, I like those. And you explain them in such depth. Well, just like you do all the mindset shifts in the book, you explain them in such depth to where if you're a person that's like, I've never visualized anything in my life. And I think it's kind of woo woo and out there. Well, Josh and I do it. And Josh and I are also very spiritual. <laughs> so like, yeah, you know, we, yeah. I like it that you just said you invite the Holy Spirit and God into the process. I do too. I'm always like, yo, this is a prayer and fast forward. Like God, there's so many things in the Bible. It's asking you shall receive that. I just feel like that it's a visualization it is truly it's gaining clarity and it's taking a moment too to like be like what do i actually want in my life because i like it mm. how you write a lot in this chapter you're like you know so many people don't visualize their dreams because they either have lack of clarity which i think is a really really big one because we're mm -hmm. always so or Agreed. it's like they're just so busy they're so busy all the time and they're going 100 miles an hour and they have no idea what they really want so um I think that that chapter, it was one of my favorites, A, because it's something I really believe, but also you really broke it down to where it's very easy, even if it's somebody that doesn't even know where to start with a visualization or something like this. There's so many, honestly, there are so many, Josh, like mindsets in the book that I was like, oh my gosh, like I wish I'd read this book 12 years ago. You know, this was, it was so, um, it was easy to read, but it was like all powerhouse information and it's a killer book. And I've read a lot of the stuff that Thank you've you. put out Thank and I've you. listened to a lot of the things, you know, the podcasts and different things, but I think this is your best work. Um, I am a big fan because I really well, think well, it well, can change your life. Mindset shifts. Well, well, well that, that means a lot. And I'll say, I feel the same way. I've written I've actually written probably 15 books, but it's published. Maybe this will be maybe my seventh, I think. But this is the best book I've written by mm -hmm. far. And it's the one I'm most proud of. And I think I think part of it was I was in bed for a year and I just I had time to really pour my heart and soul into <laughs> yeah. it and think about well, what are the things that have most transformed my life and I think can most transform someone else's. And as I mentioned before, I go through this in the book. Like I talk about like Jamie Kern Lima as an example, which I know you were on her. I love uh, Jamie. Jamie uh, on her. Mm hmm but her story is amazing. And I really go through, like she had a couple limiting beliefs. And if she would have kept on holding on to any of those limiting beliefs, she would have not even started, you know, mm -hmm. in cosmetics. She wouldn't mm -hmm. have done what she's done. And so it's like a lot of people 
have these things that are holding them back. And if they can just recognize oh, them yeah. and break through those. And so that's a big part of the book is going to, here's how you experience that breakthrough. Mm -hmm. And I want to mention too, I created, um, there's a lot of other resources with the book. If anybody decides to get yes. it, people can go to joshax.com. And um, if you get the book, I have a mindset masterclass. It's a video series you'll get for free. Um, virtue cards. So we go through the to be awesome. list, these cards to do mm -hmm. and a workbook for free and, and some other, actually a Q and a with me and some other things. And so I think we have that available for the next few weeks. So if people do get the book, you'll get, you know, a few hundred dollars worth of free bonuses. If you go to joshax.com. Awesome. Um, but yeah, I, I, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been such a, such a passion project because all these things have just, you know, impacted me in such a big way. So yeah, this book is huge and this book is going to be, it's going to be life changing for so many people, just like so many of your books have been life changing, but this is just a whole different thing. Uh, and this, it's a really powerful book. And so I'm so grateful to bring you to my community. Um, cause I know that they're just going to love this conversation as much as I have. And okay. I'm going to ask you one just like last question yeah. because it's the yeah. living fully podcast and of course, shifting our mindset and being our best selves and our healthiest selves and all that obviously helps us to live fully. But how are you living fully right now in your life with your two girls and your wife and your, all wow. your businesses? And <laughs> Man, I love this question. It's so good. You know, I think so. Um, we moved down to Puerto Rico right now and we've just had some awesome family time. I think that, um, yeah, so I have a lot of answers, but one I'm going to give you is I've just really tried to spend quality time with my, you know, we, we have a 10 week old right mm -hmm. now. So mm -hmm. Chelsea's spending so much time with, and I'm, but I'm spending so much time with our three-year-old right now. That's and and awesome. by the way, we do a little bit of co-sleeping. And so I'm sleeping with a three-year-old right now. And um, <laughs> I love it. which by the way, I've never gotten worse sleep in my life. It's been absolutely <laughs> terrible, but it is so precious. And I think about, there's this, there's this quote from uh, the psychologist and he says, there's something so sweet and special about kids from the ages of like, mm. you know, zero to five. And it's like, you know, like right now, like, so before, before she goes to sleep, we have her singing like these Bible songs. So mm -hmm. like we get in bed and sing them. And I tell her a story every night and it's never long enough. I'm like, I've been telling you a story now for 30 <laughs> minutes and it's so long, but I would just say, you know, I, I feel like I'm living so fully just with family right now and being able to That's connect awesome. with my daughter, daughter, and then, and then Chelsea and just getting really great quality time together. And, um, yeah. And, and I think, you know, I, just coming out of COVID, I think for a lot of people too, I think, I think life is about relationships. It's about building yes. deep and meaningful relationships, adding value to the people around you. And I think if you can do that, we talked about our grandfathers, you know, it's mm -hmm. like when you see people like that, that are that virtuous, where they just part, pour their heart and souls to another, like my grandfather had this sense of joy about him. Like you were around mm -hmm. him, you were like, man, this guy, Same. he's just so Same. full of joy. And so I think for us, like saying, I'm I'm going to be that type of person. And so I think for, for myself, thinking more about living fully, it's like, you know, modeling him, being connected with family. Those are, you know, th those are some big ways. So. That's awesome. Killer answer. Mm -hmm. I knew this podcast was going to be good, but it was just even better <laughs> than well, I could have well, even like wished for. So you're awesome. Well, you're so thank easy you. to talk to. So I appreciate, uh, I, I appreciate it. And, uh, again, thanks so much. And I don't know if I mentioned the title of the book, it's called think, think this, this, not that, not that. Yeah. So yes. think this, not that for everyone to check out. But, uh, again, and you know what, we're, uh, we're living comfortable here in, in Puerto Rico on our Sundays. And so thanks so oh, much you're for, the best. You know, for that too. So <laughs> I'm going to have to send her another pair, especially 10 weeks postpartum. It's like, that's all, that's all uh, you're living in is pajamas. So, yes, well, thanks exactly. so much, Dr. Axe, for being on this and for coming and just blessing my community with this. Um, I'm so excited and think this, not that is going to be linked along with all of Josh's, his website and his Instagram handle and everywhere that you can find Josh Axe, which is everywhere in the world at this point in time. So I'll link all that in the show notes. And thanks so much for coming on. Awesome. Thanks, Ma Mallory. Awesome. God bless everybody. Thanks.